Hi everyone and welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Academy for yet another special edition Gracie Breakdown. Probably one of the most important, the most important, and not because of the fight, but because of the message. You guys, some people are saying that sport Jiu Jitsu and self-defense street applicable Jiu Jitsu are the same. That there's no difference. And that sport Jiu Jitsu, practicing for points, time limits, weight classes, rules, regulations, is sufficient to prepare someone for a street fight. And they're right. Kind of. Recently, a video surfaced on the internet in which a Jiu Jitsu practitioner who is said to be of the sportive background, we don't know the guy, we don't know his teacher, but a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu got into a fight at a basketball gym. And if you haven't seen the video, check it out here. and nobody got hurt. At the end of the day, that's what really matters, especially for him who was in the fight. Now, looking from the outside at a situation like this, there is so much to extract, so many lessons that we want our students who look at this fight to learn when it comes to dealing with the real street fight altercation. And I think the first and most important is, and as you watch the video and you see kind of the buildup of the energy, is the concept that this fight should have been avoided. This fight could have been avoided, and the reality is every fight can be avoided. We talk about the de-escalation concepts, and in other videos we've mentioned the idea that if you avoid egos and alcohol, almost every fight can be avoided. Pretty much. Almost. Not <laughs> every fight. This one for sure was this an ego fight. Can be avoided. There exists some energy, and if you watch the video, you see it. You see it climbing, you see it climbing, you see it climbing to the point where, boom, it goes down. What we're suggesting is as you recognize the escalation of combative energy, you have to be the diffuser. And don't expect the random other person on the other side to do that for you. You gotta be the one to say, man, my friend, you're right. Well, you guys, he's right, everybody. I'm sorry. My bad. Especially when you know you can win the fight, you don't need to fight. Why fight? That's true. So what happened was after that verbal altercation, them talking trash with it for a little while, it got to the point where the guy who knows your shoes said, all right, blah, 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 I'll kick your boom. Right? And when you say something like that, you, you, now you push the button in me yeah. to where either A, I'm gonna walk away, because it's like, man, it's he wants to fight me, or B, I'm gonna step forward. Yes. And the moment that this unskilled person steps forward, yeah, you what can you. you not do? You, right. You can't be like, well, no, you, you can't just stand there. Well, if you do this, yeah, or if you just stand in this area right here, back a little bit, they were that close. <laughs> yeah, so if you're within one arm lane distance, we call this the red zone. So if the button gets pressed, which you want to avoid at all costs, and it escalates to a situation where it's actually going to go down, you do not want to be in the red zone with your hands down. Okay? Now, in this situation, when the, the, the opponent in the situation telegraphed extremely, like to bend your knees and get like low at an angle, he did this. He was doing this. It was very obvious that he was going to blade his body and say, what's up? Yeah, you want to get down? He started walking all weird all of a sudden. So that's like red lights flashing huge. So at that moment, you want to either get out, back up and keep a distance and give yourself time to respond to that aggressive strike and, and clinch safely and with balance and with power or you have to do something and say, hey man, it's all good. Well, the problem is that 
you said, I'll kick your butt. I know. This person messed yeah, 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 up. Yeah. The jujitsu guy can't say, yeah, I'll beat you up. And then say, hey, man, come down. It's all yes. yes. You can't. It's almost like you want the fight to start. Yeah, and I'm talking more general as well for them. Like, yes. Let's say you're at the club with an attitude looking at me, and this guy approaches you like kind of off guard. Walk up to me. Walk up to me with a chest, 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 chest. I got to say, hey, man, what's your problem? Are we cool? Do you understand? You yeah. have to be able to engage the subject, put your hands on him assertively and confidently and safely, but without necessarily hitting the guy yet, but in a way where he doesn't give him the chance. So if the guy's walking towards me, it's something we talk about with our students all the time. Come at me with the chest, 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 chest. Yeah. Hey man, what's up? Are we cool? Yeah, we're I have cool. a little, I step back with one foot, my foot steps back in base, and I plant my, my, my hands right here on his biceps, and I have a good connection. Now what's crazy is even with my eyes closed, I can read his mind right here. So now I'm like, all right, are we cool, man? Everything okay? If he's relaxed, I know everything's okay. If this arm moves back, we're gonna clinch. The fight is on. The point is he won't get off a free punch. Now some say, what about the headbutt? What about the headbutt? Go, headbutt. What's up? <laughs> headbutt what? I don't, want a headbutt. I don't want to be like this where I can get headbutt. Yeah. This matters. But the point is, if you're in the red zone, you have three options. Step all the way out, engage the subject in an intermediary position here, or skip that and just clinch the guy directly and say, hey, it's on. If the guy blades his stance, he's basically saying he's gonna punch you in the face. It's gonna go down. Now in this actual fight situation, um, none of that really happened. The guy bladed his stance like this, and he kind of stood here, the jutsu guy kind of stood here, the punch was thrown, go ahead, and he ducked luckily just below, go hit me, boom, and they fell, and they went down right here, all the way down to where they landed in the half guard, boom. Of the, course, the fact students. that they went down, yeah. the fact that they fell down just shows that this person was not ready for the, the abrupt, energy, yeah. the, the chaos, the energy that came towards him. And this is something that we practice, re have to practice regularly with students. When that energy comes, what we explain to them is you can't be in a stance that is plow plowable over, so to speak. You have to be coming with that aggressive strike. If anything, you gotta be ready to take this person back in their own direction. Especially when you when you ask for the energy. Remember, if you ask for it, be ready for it. Be re especially when the blade stands, when the guy starts looking at you like this. So we talk about clinching as a critical concept that if you don't practice it regularly, it's very abrupt. And what we saw is you get toppled over, now you're on the bottom of the fight. Now, luckily, he was able to finagle. They landed kind of in a half guard right here. Boom! And he got him in a headlock, which as we talk about is one of the most common street behaviors from an untrained person is get a headlock, right? And luckily, because he was kind of in the half guard, he was able just to kind of turn his body and land with his hook in, boom, and he got the back right here. And from the back, that's when the people from the outside kind of started thinking about breaking up the fight, but then they said, no, let it go, let it go, they let it keep going. And at this point, get up a little on your elbow. He was about to get up, he had the back mount, and that's when the subject on the back here threw a punch. And at that very moment, everything was lost. You have to be able to prioritize the position in a situation like this. And whenever someone throws a punch from the back mount, to us it's an indicator that that person is not throwing punches or receiving punches in training on a regular basis. Because if I try to back mount Hedron and I try to throw a punch in the back of the head one time, ever, he knows that I'm not doing what? Locking, controlling, isolating, and choking and holding him. So he's instantly going to be gone right there. But if we just grapple and we never consider punch and we never throw him in the equation and we're just sport grappling the whole time, there's makes sense that if I get into a fight and the emotion is high, that I'm gonna try to hit you from everywhere I can, including the back mount, but I'm gonna learn the hard way and too late yeah. that I lost a great positional control for the sake of a punch that was inefficiently utilized, so to speak. But uh, luckily, as soon as the guy spun out into the guard, the jiu-jitsu practitioner was able to kind of climb his legs up, stand up right there. He was kind of like climb his legs up and ended up like working the arm right here. And this guy pulled this arm out and then he's able to spin this way a little bit and get this one over. Now, his legs were tight. He was going for the arm break. You don't gotta pick me up and slam me. But at this point, he got picked up from this hanging position to where he got swung under to this position. Boom, right here. And fortunately, they were playing on wood not on the concrete, and more importantly, the guy who picked him up was his same size or a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. If the guy in a street fight, which is not uncommon, was 50 pounds heavier and actually had leverage to pick him up, we cannot allow ourselves to stay connected on a submission for an inverted pickup. Now, we don't know if this guy in the fight would have let go if he got picked up a little higher, maybe. Maybe he would have. But for our students, anybody who's watching this who wanted to take the most from the experience, 
You have yeah. to know that you can't get picked up from submissions ever. And part of the reason why you might, you know, fight so hard to keep an arm lock or a triangle and risk getting picked up is because you feel as if you really have to secure that arm lock for your safety. And, and that's the type of jujitsu person that, that has to win the fight because if they don't win now, there's a fear of, of, of a, a getting knocked out or right. getting hurt in a moment. It, but yeah. when your focus is just not getting hurt and surviving, you have no problem releasing an arm lock or triangle to prevent being slammed to live, and, yeah. and just live a little longer and save yourself. Yeah, so that's that survival mindset over the I gotta win right now mindset, which can be dangerous when you latch onto someone who might slam you, especially if they're heavier. So he came out, boom, they slammed. And then after that, they ended up in the leg entanglement, uh, what some people call the 50-50 position. The opponent lost his balance, and he got a nice heel hook in the street fight. And it was such a cool position because the guy, the other the opponent, was so unable to move from there that he, the, the, the jiu-jitsu practitioner, had the heel hook and was able to say, hey, if you move, I'm going to break your knee. And we're very glad it ended in that situation where it was a controlled submission that wasn't a slam possibility, and everything kind of stopped, and the guys kind of broke it up, and a lady walked in at that point. So it got neutralized. Um, so what we observe and what we want to extract from this for students and people that we will teach in the future and already teaching obviously is what concerns us the most is the overall lack of consideration for control and slowing the fight down and the eagerness to win and to catch and to go and to hurt the other person so fast and so abrupt is what causes this loss of control. And it's especially true because in a fight like this, you have an opponent who's not following the jujitsu pattern, so to speak, and is moving chaotically. So when you fight someone in a street fight, you can't afford to be jumping from submission to submission because every time you transition, you're creating movement, you're creating opening, and his, his, it's almost like if we hold a rubber band, pull it tight, and you try to change your grip right now, change your grip, boom, it's gonna snap out because there's so much tension and so much chaos in the movements of the person that all that aggressive changing and moving and trying to hit the guy at the wrong time allows for more movement versus just trying to slow it down, control, yeah. slow the fight down, take your time and relax. Even though they're behaving chaotically, you gotta be able to, but that's hard to do if you don't practice like that. So to answer the question, can sport jujitsu training prepare you to defend yourself in a real fight? Yes, to the same degree that, you know, recreational sport, Taekwondo, Judo, wrestling, boxing, so weightlifting, football, rugby. So being athletic yes. helps you in being a physical athletic. confrontation and, like a fight. And each of these particular skills can help you in certain aspects of the fight. But Jiu Jitsu, when practiced for street self-defense, is so much more wholesome and so much more all-encompassing that that's what we want people to understand and to have access to and to know the difference in. And it's crazy because people ask me the difference. One of the easiest ways to compare it was I was under the impression that ping pong and tennis were very similar. They aren't the same, obviously, but ping pong and tennis are like, you know, street jiu-jitsu and sport jiu-jitsu in the sense that they're very similar, so they're kind of the same. You guys, I couldn't have been more wrong in this comparison. I'm a purple belt in ping pong. I'm legit, pop, 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 I get down. I got taken to the mat, to the tennis court for my introductory tennis lesson. And in my mind, I'm thinking, man, this is gonna be so fun because I'm gonna be so good organically. Because you're just a black belt and you're good at everything. Well, I'm a purple belt in ping pong, so I'm gonna transfer no. that, I'm gonna get down. And I went out there, you guys, I couldn't have been more shocked by the realization yeah. that my ping pong skills were not transferable. Maybe my athleticism and running back and forth, maybe hitting the ball over two times, but man, the coordination, the reflexes and the skills needed to be successful in tennis, I had none of that. And I thought I did. And we're very concerned that the sport jujitsu community is practicing a, a sport thinking that it's more effectively preparing them than it actually is. And we saw some examples in this fight, but even this fight wasn't a great example because he's fighting someone his same size. You know what I'm saying? And with Jiu Jitsu or without, he could have done all right because he's an athletic guy fighting someone your same size. So our concern is for the sport Jiu Jitsu practitioners who haven't fought yet, but may eventually find themselves in an altercation with someone who outweighs them by 50 pounds. And when that happens, we're very worried that they're gonna have the same realization that I had when I hit the tennis court. It does not apply. And there's a huge difference. Let's discuss the three differences between sport and street Jiu Jitsu. Number one, the techniques two, the timing, and three, the training objectives. Yeah. When it comes to techniques, 
Well, the technique, you, your consideration for points in a sport setting will cause you to behave unwisely or unsafely in a street setting if you develop the reflex and you transfer that. And so one of the best examples of this is when someone's in the guard and they pass the guard, boom, you pass my guard in a sport setting. If he don't land side mount chest to chest for several seconds, he gets his points for passing the guard. Most people out there who teach jujitsu will tell this person at all costs, avoid yeah, getting side mounted. Pass. So if you can't put him back in the guard at all costs, go to your knees in the second recourse. You avoided the points, but now you expose your head. Well, it doesn't matter because you can't punch me. I can't punch you in the back of the head? No. It's not allowed? No, it's not allowed. In the UFC? In toward jujitsu. There is no, listen. We just don't want you to have the reflex to give your back when something just as simple as getting your guard pass is about to happen to you. Imagine the disastrous yeah. street fight consequences of this. And what's good evidence? MMA. How many fights are won from the turtle position where they just hit me a couple so times? So many. And when the a, guy just, the ref stops the fight because the guy's about to get knocked out. When a fighter ends up where I am right now, they're very happy because they know if they just throw 10 punches or eight the that are unanswered by the bottom person, the fight the is saved. The and the back of the head cannot be hit. You have to hit on the front side or the side of the face. Because if they hit you here a couple times, But in a street fight, you get hit twice here, once here, it's bad news. So imagine having the reflex of rolling to your knees instinctively every day in the gym to avoid the point, guard pass points, and then doing that in a real fight. Now, some of you say, well, I would never do that. No, you do what you do. You do what you do. And what does Pedro Valenci say about rolling to your knees? Well, he says that this turtle position is great for turtles because they were blessed with a nice hard shell. Makes sense. Most of you guys don't have these shells. So Pedro would not suggest going to the turtle position and we're on the same boat. Another very unique technical difference between rolling in the academy or in a sport realm compared to a street fight is the no slamming rule. Right? The idea that you cannot slam, whether it's a submission, if you have me in an arm lock, we saw this in the fight right now. Yes. The guy had a perfectly locked in arm lock. The guy in the guard, no, no jujitsu, picked him up and slammed him on his head. Luckily, he wasn't strong enough or big enough to pick him up any higher. And fortunately, they were on wood and not on concrete. Because wood, basketball floors are unusually soft and forgiving. Right? Because kids fall all the time. You guys, imagine the reflex of locking a submission to triangle and knowing in your head that they can't slam you. You see it all the time. In sport jujitsu, guys get picked up all the way from a triangle, but the guy cannot drop him back down. What a great rule if you want to finish the triangle. But in a street fight, whether you're in closed guard, we've seen this, where he don't just stand up, pick me up, go. He just stands up, boom, boom, up we go. And imagine getting hit right here. Boom. One time he don't did this to a guy in a, in a jujitsu tournament when he was younger, where slamming was allowed, and he did it, but the guy was so unaccustomed to the slamming allowance and the, the opportunity, because in their school, they didn't allow it, that his head hit the ground and he passed out. The guy went a concussion and got knocked out in that situation. Now, I don't think you expected him to keep his guards so close for so long, did you? Like, you expected him to open it? Because you well, picked him up. As I was slamming him, I could feel he wouldn't open his guard. Shoot, he's gonna, but you didn't expect him to get knocked out necessarily, but it was amazing how easy it was. Well, right? I expected just a shock, a, a and wind, open his guard, yes. the wind out But of his himself. head was yeah. relaxed and it bounced off the mat, and the guy was top level competitor, very good guy. His head bounced just a little, boom, hit the mat, and he knocked out cold. <laughs> so I don't let anybody pick me up, ever. Huge deal. Even if I know they won't slam me, Yes. It doesn't happen. Even when we spar with no punches and no street mm -hmm. here, we still have a street mindset of, man, don't be picked up because we respect that the homie could slam you in a real fight. And I'll, he don't won't slam me, but I'm not going to take advantage of the niceness in the academy. And because I, I want, I, I know what matters to me. And what matters is the reflex to protect myself and save myself. Yes. Another example, if you're, whether it's half guard or side mount, half guard, side mount, bottom of the position, if you want to escape in a hurry, because now this goes into where the timing, the time limits too, right? Mm -hmm. So when it goes to time limits, you think in this position right now, forget survival, let's think about creating movement, right? So what will someone often do from here? Let's go under and let's come out the back right here. Or let's go under the legs and let's come out the other way. And let's come out and let's get up and let's create all the movement we can. Now, again, doing this means you're not doing what? 
Well, if you're going under, his hands are free. And the per <laughs> this is free. Punches, the fight's over. You guys, the same way we can win the fight with one choke. Somebody can win with one. Punch in your head, bouncing on the pavement, the fight's over. So if, you're, if your only reflex from half guard is to go under or from side mount, same thing, is to come under and come under and so, half side mount, is to come under and come out and do whatever. We're not saying these moves can't work. They can work. But if you prioritize the escape and the movement, because of a shortened time limit over punch safe positioning of hands being here or even here, prioritize the, the neutralization of the hand position, right? Versus trying to say, I'm gonna get up at all costs and getting punched in the process. So these are some examples from a timing perspective how feeling like you gotta behave quickly and get out and get those points in six minutes or seven or eight or 10 or whatever it is forces you to do things that put you in great danger from a street fight perspective. And the question is, when do you want to find out that your half guard is not punch proof or your bottom side mount is not punch safe? Now, yesterday. You can speculate that it might be when the fight comes one day or you can discover and analyze today whether you have this or not. And that's our big concern. And ultimately, you know, another thing regarding timing in a real fight is the chaos of the other guy. Yes, the bottom. And real back, quick, one step back to the clock, you know, a time limit. There has never been a time limit in my match, in my life, during any match, whether it's Even here, if there was a time limit. Even if there was a time limit, there wasn't in my head. Yeah. So we might have five minute rounds here. We might have a match that I do in some little, you know, back, I did Metamoris, there was a 20 minute time limit. There wasn't 20 minutes. There was no time for me right there. Right. Now, um, about timing of your opponent. Right, so we're talking timing means two things, time limit, and it also means technical timing and execution. So when you side mount somebody who knows jujitsu, how, you know, how sporadic are their movements? How crazy are they? they not that crazy, but when you side mount the guy down the street, as soon as you land in the side mount or the full mount, they're gonna bridge, twist, turn, push, extend, try to stand up and get away because they're uncomfortable on their backs. This will catch you off guard. The same way you can be caught off guard standing up. Yes, right? The abruptness, the abruptness of his entry. Somebody rushing you, punching you. This to us is a timing difference between yeah. training for sportive against other jujitsu timed individuals and training at the street opponent who doesn't have any rules or concerns or problems to follow. In some ways, me in a jujitsu behaved uh, state is an easier opponent to deal with for Hidon Much easier. than someone who is 50 pounds heavier and completely knows jujitsu because that guy behaves in ways that are not predictable, that are not following the same guidelines and rules that we accept in this language of jujitsu that we adhere to. When it comes to me getting a street fight against somebody, the person that I would probably like to fight is the purple belt. Yes. The, jitsu, the brown belt. But that's somebody I understand, someone who's predictable to me. Right. But the person that who does, who's a little bit unpredictable is the guy who knows nothing. Yes. Right? The person who's filled with fear, that's someone who we have to prepare for, and that's why this kind of timing is you important need to, incorporate. to address. We need to incorporate, and we're gonna talk about that. Talking about training objectives, at the end of the day, you have to decide in your brain, what is a gold medal for you? What is the championship belt for you? What is the highest level of success and effectiveness for you? In our minds, the way we categorize it in our minds for everyday training is, the highest level of success is avoid defeat at all costs. We take great pride in our submission counters, in our comfort and worst case scenarios, in our ability to predict problems before they happen and shut them down. And this applies to punches as well as submissions. Mm -hmm. Avoid defeat at all costs, our number one priority. Number two is when the opportunity presents itself, seize the opportunity and win by submission. Points don't exist in our mind. If I sweep, you don't, we're sparring, it means nothing. It just means that I'm on top for a few seconds and now I have a chance to attack a top submission versus a bottom submission. Something our grandfather always said was, whoever does not lose the fight can only win. There you go. So just by not losing, you have won. And that, he, that meant that he was just very happy yeah. with a draw. A draw to him was the greatest thing in the world. When to most people, when it's a draw... Well, you judges now. The judges. There's judges. There's, there's points. People. You can't leave it to a draw. Yes. It's a serious So if the training happen. objective is, 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 is entertainment or sport success, that forces you to behave in a way that chases the approval or the point or the, or the nod of a judge versus prioritizing survival at the highest level, right? Because 
if you're just sitting there surviving versus going, 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 you're not gonna win any UFC fight and you're not gonna win any sport match by surviving, so to speak. Now, you might eventually mess up, you take advantage of it, but for the most part, to be the world champion in a sportive realm, you gotta chase the points, you gotta have the most innovative ways to acquire those points, whether you get submitted or not, or whether you submit someone or not, you gotta be chasing the entire time, sometimes to your own demise. And that's what we're talking about. Objectives, training objectives. And if next month's tournament is the number one objective for this academy, naturally when we teach class, we're gonna focus on strategies and techniques and concerns and time limits and rules that apply in the tournament. So we're gonna ignore all techniques, all training mindsets, all strategies that could be very helpful and necessary for a real fight for the sake of better preparing for next month's tournament. And it's not enough to say, oh, that this world champion or that world champion would do okay in a street fight, would be safe if they were to defend them against the average punk. Well, we know that. They're That's not the concern. They're professional athletes. That's not the concern. We're talking about you who's watching this video, who's been training for five years, six years, three years, seven years. You're 43 years old. You know what I'm saying? And you have an altercation against your daughter's boyfriend, brother, who is doing something ridiculous, and this guy outweighs you by 50 pounds with an attitude and spits in your face. We're concerned that at that moment, your idea of your preparation up until that point may not be entirely and holistically transferable to that street altercation and you're gonna be in for a rude awakening. We want you guys to be yeah. awakened before that actually goes down. And, and we know that most people out there, they started Jiu Jitsu because they want to feel confident and defend themselves and be ready to protect themselves and their families. With some additional invaluable information on this topic, we cut away to the Valente brothers in North Miami Beach. Thank you, Hiro and Hanner, for inviting us to such an important conversation. Um, we're, we're very happy that the self-defense talk is really back to the table. We, we really feel how important this is. It's really about the essence of Jiu-Jitsu being preserved. And despite what, what some, uh, very few, I would say, minority, uh, and I think greatly due to lack of knowledge, lack of really understanding the self-defense system, learning the self-defense system, which is unfortunately something that I think this conversation is here to help fix. But um, we really have been witnessing all this renewed interest in the self-defense portion of Jiu-Jitsu, the techniques that really made Jiu-Jitsu what it is. Even before the Gracie family in Japan, throughout history, such a respected uh, system that actually equipped the, the ultimate warriors, the samurai, with this um, unbelievable uh, set of techniques that is often referred to as the triumph of human intelligence over brute strength. So I think we can definitely try to add to the conversation and we should talk to, to our friends a little bit about the definition of jiu-jitsu, Billy. Well, number one, jiu-jitsu utilizes the laws of physics. As you said, the triumph of human intelligence. It's based on using leverage, based on yielding to your opponent's energy and using it to your advantage, to be able to survive a real assault. Also, jiu-jitsu, by its own definition, is complete in nature. It's a comprehensive fighting strategy including striking techniques, throwing techniques, grappling techniques, stand-up self-defense techniques against surprise attacks, and a philosophy, a lifestyle, a true way of life. Well, I think that um, one of the challenges is the entertainment factor. Nowadays, not, not just the MMA world, but even within the Jiu-Jitsu community, uh, we see a lot of people wanting to bring entertainment. Can't that be a challenge when it comes to the self-defense aspect being preserved? Definitely, these are conflicting goals, objectives. Are you trying to entertain, to entertain others, entertain fans, spectators, or are you trying to survive an assault? Many times, surviving techniques can be boring for people who are watching, but they can be highly effective in a real fight. The way that we practice Jiu-Jitsu, always considers striking. Obviously, when we spar, many times we go at each other at 
And in order to do that, we have safety precautions. Many, many times we're not throwing punches at each other. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. But we're always thinking about punches and we're never jeopardizing techniques or strategies just because punches are not allowed. We're not taking advantage of loopholes that rules sometimes create. Slamming, for example. We're not gonna keep our guard closed when somebody's picking us up off the ground just because there is a new rule in sports jiu-jitsu where slamming is not allowed, but in reality it's putting us in a very vulnerable situation. So it's about the mindset when you spar. Is it a self-defense mindset or is it a point mindset? We do not want to divide jiu-jitsu. We actually want to help jiu-jitsu continue to be the most effective, the best self-defense system in the world. And I think to do that, we cannot allow Jiu-Jitsu to lose its self-defense identity. Thanks a lot, bros. So here it is, you guys. The reality is most of the people watching this video train at a school, just based on sheer numbers, and we know this, where even if they fully agree with and understand everything we're saying, and, and, and they want to understand, and they want to learn, and they want to be fully prepared for all the contingencies of a street fight, they're in a school where that's not the training focus. They're in a school where if they get side mounted by someone, the instructor is most likely telling them, go, 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 go. Get out of there, go somewhere. Versus Great relax, work. save the energy, hold tight, and wait till he makes an opening for you to escape. That being said, we wanted to give you guys, for the first time ever, what we call the four filters that you can use to adapt and modify and specialize your sparring and your training experiences in a sport jutsu school to make your personal training journey more transferable and more applicable to a street fight, a real street fight altercation, okay? So here's the deal. The four filters. Filter number one, manage the distance. Filter number two, control the chaos. Filter three, strike strategically. And filter four, survive efficiently. My favorite. <laughs> so what does this mean? This means that in your academy, once a week, twice a week, get a partner who's on the same hype of, man, I'm, I wanna know how to fight. I wanna know that what I'm doing is directly applicable in a real fight. So let's do this. Get a cooperative partner. And here's how you guys are gonna spar to maximize the benefit for both of you guys. When you are on the bottom of the fight, okay, when one person will be the target, the subject of the sparring, and the other person there is there for the for the, for the benefit of the other partner. You need someone to, to play with you, to play along to make this beneficial. When you are on the bottom of the fight, okay, we want you to ask this person, or just let the person know the rules beforehand. The top person, the bad guy here, is gonna try to touch your head, is gonna try to strike. Even if you guys don't have gloves, it's nice to have little finger gloves and do it, even if you don't. It's gonna be reaching for your face anytime they're on top of the fight, whether it's guard, side mount, half guard. My goal is to be touching Hidon's head right here, okay? Look at this, so you see how all of a sudden, I'm trying to go for his face, but I can't. Boom, boom. Look at this, so he's very much, and he don't, what, is, what is he don't concern right now? His only concern is to manage the distance from every position to where I have no direct access to his face. Okay, and manage distance means two things. Entry prevention, block it, boom, and retraction prevention, look. Right, because you can have great blocks, make two blocks, just kind of put your hands up and block. Mm -hmm. You can have great blocks, but if I can retract at my own pace, boom, that means I can come down as I want. So no matter what half guard, no matter what position it is, you want to prevent retraction and, and you want to prevent entry. And, and look at like, Henner's hitting like this. I'm just reaching for his yeah, head. Yeah, everything is very light and that's important because if yes. it becomes too stressful and, and too tense and you require too much energy on both sides, like you even saw, if like for a second when he threw my legs, I, I ended up like this for a second. And I just boom, boom, boom. boom. Everything is, I, I'm not scared. Right. But I'm still acknowledging that yes. which he's, you know, giving me, which are strikes. So I'm trying to challenge him and, 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 and puzzle him a little bit, but I'm not trying to make him fearful in this training because if it's fearful, it's not focused and it's not fun. It can be very fun and very productive and very effective at, at making a street applicable without it being damaging or injurious. If my hand different. is blocking with like just 20% right here, he could try to power past my block, but he doesn't. He acknowledges that I have, you know, I'm ready for this. Now, obviously I wouldn't want to let him mount, but at the same time, I do like him mounted. Cause I want to know what, what's the natural behavior for you, right? 
for now yeah. to hit me. Yeah. Oh, I want to feel this. Or he might sit up and get away and I pull him down. So now it's a fully different, all these behaviors are going to be completely different patterns than if you don't, than if I'm here, relax. You understand? Your concerns are totally different than if I'm touching versus going for the submission. So, filter number one, have your partner reach for your head, striking, touching the head, boom, boom, boom. And you manage the distance accordingly and shut it down. And know, as a general rule, they can't strike at you effectively without giving space. And that space is your escape opportunity. As you play that game, that's what we want you to focus on. Filter number two, controlling the chaos. When he don't side bounce on top of his cooperative partner who's trying to help him become street ready, instead of me being here, now I'm the, now he don't steal the subject of the, of the drill and I'm on the bottom. Let's say he sweeps me at one point or escapes my mount and passes my guard, now he's here. Put me in the guard, hip out, The me most guard. valuable thing I can do, yeah. Well, well him putting me in the guard is, is, jiu -jitsu, is you yeah. doing jujitsu. Which you know how to stop. Correct. Because you're a brown belt. And that's what you're gonna wanna do at first for those of us who are gonna be the helpful I'm gonna partners. wanna do that, like get out don't and Don't do that. So what I can do to be the greatest possible benefit to Hedon here is to, from the bottom, not be here like, oh, I got, I'm hitting you. These are not knockout punches. There's a huge difference between these and what we were talking about before here. Boom, these punches are elbow from here. That's a problem. Not so much these right here. So I'm not gonna be most threat and most street concerning from down here. So show us what you would look like if you were somebody who was trying to escape, not <laughs> unskillful. <laughs> So it's called controlling the chaos. Now when I do that, I don't benefit very much other than the exercise in the lungs. He benefits because he gets to feel someone escape without jujitsu patterns. Learn the timing, learn the movements, and most importantly, don't panic. You were calm. Yeah, I also felt on your side, like you weren't straining yourself 100%. I, I didn't want to hurt myself. Yes. But I want to do things that were not just to patterns. Yes. And, and I felt myself, I don't want to be so perfectly controlled, so tight. Yes. Because then maybe you won't even begin. I can't, yeah. To, yeah to, if, to you have cross face, if you have cross face underhook, I'm not going to be able to even budge you Yeah, much. so I almost want to let go a little bit and, and Make yeah. mistakes, troubleshoots will happen. Allow it. Because I want to go from side mount to full mount to your back. Shut back them down. Full mount. Make more space. Shut them down. Always make more maintaining space. the safe position. Yes. Even if that means sometimes I end up in the bottom, I'm still managing distance. Great point. Close. So be tight, but allow movement so you can practice different mm -hmm. positions. Especially if the person on top is heavier, you need to leave me a little opening so I can start creating some chaotic movement to allow you to control the chaos. But imagine if you never do this. Then when someone finally gets on the bottom of you and side mount or half guard or mount, they're going to go crazy and you're going to say, what the heck is this guy doing? I've never felt these behaviors before. So ask your partner to do this for you and then guess what? You do it for them. Strike strategically. This was a huge deal in the fight that we saw where the guy who knew Jiu Jitsu, he got on the back mount and because the adrenaline of the fight and because probably he's not striking in regular practice at the academy, he thought we're fighting, which means fighting, you're supposed to punch which means I'm on his back, so I'm gonna punch this guy. But when he did that, as we saw, he lost the back mount, okay? So, in that situation, it's not the time to strike. I would never strike at Hedon from supinated back mount position, because as soon as I let go, boom, boom, I lose what I have. I would stay on his back 10 to one, I would wanna keep the position. But I can understand fully how someone who does not strike in practice will emotionally strike when it counts. You want them to strike in practice? I want them to strike at home, strategically so they don't strike emotionally at work yeah so because you need to know got it you need to know when <laughs> it's, it's okay to let go and do that without losing everything right so even if you don't even this counts as a strike just for example lay on your back strike just means um you want to do from the TSC? sure like from here yeah like you're not going to be emotional right now you need to understand like what would happen if i did strike and I could probably guess he's gonna roll to his knees. That's a good guess, based on so, in 85 this case, years of I fights. I might not strike. Ask Hicks on right here, you punch, the guy's gonna roll. In this case, it. I probably wouldn't strike because I'm not really, I don't really need you to roll to your knees. Well, you're, you're cool right here. Yes. But the point is, at least you like to know that if I strike, that's what would happen. And, and you, as my partner, you have to do what makes sense right now to Yeah, you. I gotta go. Yeah. I gotta go. I have no choice. I have no choice. Now, right now, if you punch, I'm gonna get up. Boom. Yeah. 
So there's certain times where the strike makes sense. Now, right one now, yeah, if you punch right now, punch my head. Boom, you might let go and he's gonna sit up. Yeah, I need to have both hands up because I know what you want to do in most cases from here, and that is you want to hurt me. So my number one priority is staying safe. So go ahead and knee inside right here, go shrimp out. But if you get 1.5, nice control, hold side away. Now strike right here with this arm, elbow straight back. Look, boom, that would be a good way to, at least they're not gonna hit your partner. But you can place a strike right there, why? Because you're managing my posture so well that that's an effective time to test a little strike. What's the moral of the story? If you strike strategically, and we're not saying hit each other, just to be clear. No, he just, would never try just, to, just, just like this. <sighs> just placement of the strikes, and right? Positioning the strikes in practice and learning when you can and cannot get away with it while still maintaining control. And you will know that in a fight, you're gonna be okay. Versus guessing when to strike in a fight and not knowing how to use them in, properly. In, in a five minute roll, you might actually strike strategically three to five times. Just to set something up, make him yes. roll, set up an arm lock. If his hands are like this, from side mount, you punch him once, he puts his hand and, up and blocks. And in most cases, it's not multiple strikes. Yeah, I it's use not this one like, all the time. I use this one all the time. I go here like this, like keep his hand glued to your chest. Don't mm -hmm. have to, let me get inside yeah. this arm. I'll be like this sitting down and I want to get this arm away. So I'll go like this. Boom. I'll you go back, I'll do like this, I'll go like this. What does he know? He knows. He knows that if I do that, he better block my arm. Otherwise, he's getting punched in a real fight. Then I bring my knee inside, then I switch, then I go. Boom. Even though you wouldn't suggest that attack right there in a street fight. Are you serious? I'm not. What you just did right there, you would not do that. You would not do that against the guy at 7 Eleven. That's true. Good. That's a different story, though. So, what's the moral of the story? Place strikes strategically at home so that when you go to work, you can place them unemotionally because it's normal for you already. And you know, this makes you really, it makes you want to punch less. Yes. Because the bottom line is the more emotional you are and the more you're striking, the less control you have. So, it's going to really teach you that punching is not. Necessary in yeah. most cases. Correct. Last but not least, surviving efficiently. And he don't already talked about this. This is the idea that when you're in an inferior position in the academy, 100% accept that victory is in just surviving, avoiding the punches and avoiding the submission of that opponent. You don't have to get out. That's such an idea that's created by the time limits or the point consideration and the feeling that you have to do something now to get out and get on top and dominate the situation. And it goes back to training objectives. What's your goal? If I side mount Hidon, he does not try to get out all crazy. He totally lays down until I forget that I actually have him under control. And then I start to move and do stuff for my submission and suddenly he comes out 100% at the right time, saving so much energy versus trying to get out chaotically while I'm there smashing him and holding him down. Right? Yeah. Most people, who do jujitsu would love to, you know, be better at avoiding arm locks and sweeps and chokes and, and even punches. And the reason why you keep getting arm locked and choked and punched is because you have an agenda and that agenda invo involves you winning and you going forward and you attacking. So you expose yourself. Yes. So the best advice I've ever heard in my life was from my grandfather, which is stop trying to defeat your opponent, your training partner, just don't lose. And when you do that, it's wild how all of a sudden, what starts to appear more than ever before? Opportunities. Opportunities for me to win. Submissions, yeah. If you just take the survival first mindset, that you have to honestly be happy with just not getting tapped out, which is typical because in today's world, you know, everybody praises those who get the submission, who get the choke or the arm lock or the foot lock. But around here, that's not the case. We praise. You survived, that was amazing. Even if you only survived for two minutes, but then you got choked, I'm not worried about the fact that you got choked, I'm so happy you survived for at least two minutes against your training partner who was 45 pounds heavier. Right, that's major victory in itself. So they're watching this, and they're thinking, okay, these are great filters, and if you're training in a sportive arena, in a sportive academy, and you wanna apply these filters to make your training more street applicable, great, get a partner, ask him, when you're on top, touch my head. And when you're on the bottom, bro, go ahead and go crazy right now, and try to get out for 30 yeah. seconds, and you hold him down. And when you're on top of you, the, at the offensive position, use your strikes, place them to control the guy, and to move him into a submission, or a better control, or to burn his energy, this is all great, and be patient when you're on the ground. But they're wondering, what if I don't have a partner who can do that with me? Can right. you still make your sparring session street when you're rolling against someone who's sport? That's what I was about to say, and, you, and they're I'm wondering sorry. that. Luckily, we they have the need same that. Tell you them. need to know that. First of all, this idea of having a training partner who will strike you and, and act make you know, very yes. unskillfully, 
that would be nice to have someone do that once a week. Once a week is, is great, but more the, is better. But at the very minimum, like we do here, once, twice a week is critical to keep that sword sharp and those reflexes available. The other two or three, four days a week, you have to have reflexes such as, like when I mounted on Henry, right? When I mount him, what's the first thing on my mind? Control. Is him being chaotic and him being unskillful. So I'm, no, no, don't, don't do it. Don't I see, I see, I see. Cause let's just say you're not. I see. You're Henry, right. but I'm still here. Right. I'm still, keep, yeah, I'm still thinking that if it was someone who might go crazy, I would want to be low to be most prepared. And also, let's say, let's say that you, you. let's Sorry. say you strategically roll me out. Boom, technical. He rolls me out with a good technique. My, I don't want my answer to be one and start attacking for an arm. Right when I land, my first thought is this. Nice. No, don't even hit. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm sport. I'm sport. Yeah, go, go. Yeah, I'm sport. I'm here. still wanting to make posture. Here. Here. But he don't. Yeah, here. good point. So what you're saying is even without them being involved in the drill. Yeah, you just do your jiu-jitsu normal. Right, and you're still managing distance. You're still aware of where my hands are. Yeah. So no, no. <laughs> he's still getting the can. He can't help but be a good partner. But and naturally, but when you do this, it, it will it will be interesting because your blocking of punches, you'll see that it'll complicate this person's Jiu -jitsu. Normal jiu-jitsu, yes. Even though you're not striking, right. it's gonna complicate your normal jiu-jitsu. Right. And you, let's say that, go ahead, throw my legs out of the way. Here, go ahead and arm lock me. I can't because he's safe with his hands. You can't arm lock me? Right now, I cannot. Try no. for some chokes or arm locks. Nope, are you punching? No, I'm, I'm going, jiu-jitsu. <laughs> so, that's a great point. So Mount. you're saying. Mount, so, just here. Right. Don't punch, don't punch. I'm not going for chokes, going for chokes. Be jiu-jitsu. And I'm not closing the distance right now. I could be hugging his body mm -hmm. and pulling him down. But, and I'm not doing that. It crossed my mind, but all I'm doing, my small portion of hand control is just this. Right. Just so at least I know where your hand is. So you're saying that you can make, yeah, it's so major. So what's the definition then of sport jiu-jitsu? It's not so much a set curriculum of fancy point, uh, point chasing techniques, but rather the, it's characterized by a lack of consideration for the street applicability of your techniques. So if when you're sparring normally, like you just witnessed with Hiron, there is a very high level of consideration, even if you're not getting punched, you're just rolling, but there's still a consideration for this right here, I know where his hand is right here. Or if I'm about to do this sweep that I know exposes my face, you are aware of that versus there not being an awareness. And if I'm gonna do that sweep, it's gonna be a while after I first established, yes. you know, safe hand positioning first. Yes. I probably wouldn't do the sweep at all in most cases. Yeah, but. So it's not so much decided by techniques as much as a mindset of, absence of consideration for how your techniques would ever apply in a real fight. And like we were saying, you can spar normally and still be street. We can both be grappling with no punches and no slams, and yet we're 100% sharpening reflexes for the street because the goal is survival, energy efficiency, managing distance. Even when punches aren't yeah. being thrown, we're thinking of these things. And you could tell by my behaviors, there was no, no thought of winning. I wasn't trying to ever arm lock or choke him. I was always just feeling where you were. I don't want to choke you, I don't want to win. I just want to be there and if shut eight, it down. If eight minutes go by and I just stopped all your attacks and I never submitted you, great, no problem. And if six minutes go by and the guy messes up and goes too aggressive, he will escape, he will pass my guard and he will take advantage of the gift. But what he's suggesting here is that there can be a full gratification in shutting someone down because at the end of the day, if you get into a street fight, against someone bigger, heavier, stronger, crazier, uglier than you. And nobody wins the fight. This is you, this is them. And nobody wins. Neutral. Both go home, nobody goes to the hospital. Who won the fight? Me. We did. Okay? At the end of the day, survival is victory. And when you have that as your gold medal, as your primary objective, everything changes in training. So these four filters are beautiful for them because they can streetify what they already know, even of their sportive skills, can be applied a new mindset that makes it much more street applicable, barring some very sport techniques that have no place in a street fight. Now, what these filters do not do is they won't teach them new techniques for street situations that they've never been exposed to. Like, they could say, I've never learned how to block a punch from the guard in my life. 
So these filters don't solve that problem. They might solve a little bit, like they might be blocking hands, but there's a system behind not getting punched from the guard. They've never learned how to escape an actual headlock in a street fight. They've never learned how to block a sucker punch. So you have to go learn it. Yes, so for that, we have certified training centers. There are many Gracies out there who teach jujitsu for self-defense and many non-Gracies. Yes, many non-Gracies. And the number of schools is growing every day of schools who are aware of this and are offering this, making it available. But to get the actual techniques, you need to go to a source that offers street applicable techniques in jujitsu. And obviously you can find those at gracieuniversity.com. Now, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is, <laughs> why are we even doing this? Well, here's our concern and here's why we feel it's necessary to talk on this situation. Because the reason the world fell in love with jujitsu is because of the unprecedented string of victories by jiu-jitsu representatives in real fights. And people who show up at a jiu-jitsu school are going because of that reputation, that long-standing reputation of unmatched effectiveness in real combat. And when they asked the teacher, do you teach that? Do you teach what Hoist Gracie did in the UFC or so-and-so fighter? Yes. The answer is yes. They say we do teach it. But the reality is a student might be there for two years and never even talk about a punch from the Forget guard. two years. They might train and get the black belt. They might train 10 years today and never learn how to block a punch from the guard or any position ever. It's possible. So if you don't talk about fighting, don't say that you do. And we ourselves, yes. if somebody walks in here and says, he don't, I want to learn how to medal, point I, jiu I want to win a tournament and be the best at this tournament game. I'm going to say this is not for you. Matter of fact, if you just drive one hour in either direction, you'll probably cross 25 schools that can better serve you. Yes. So, so our I'm, push, I'm constantly yeah, pushing yeah, business yeah. Yeah. to everybody else that I know are the best in the world at yes. putting people in tournaments. So the concern Who's is better than me at putting people in tournaments. In what sense? Who is better than me? What jujitsu instructors are better than me at creating people for tournaments? All of them. All of them. <laughs> and that's okay. Good job. You guys are doing it. Keep doing it. Yeah. So yeah. our concern, let's be very clear. Our concern is not sport jujitsu. Our concern is you try to be better than us no. at what we do. No, our concern is the deception that exists. That's the same thing. I know, but it's a nicer way of saying it. No. Our concern is the deception that exists when someone goes to a sport jujitsu school and is misled to believing that what they're learning is immediately and entirely applicable and all they need to be effectively prepared for a worst case street fight altercation. And that's the, the deception is what bothers us and why we feel the necessity to make these videos and, and to educate because our grandfather would not stand for that. There you go. And the reason why I know that I'm doing it better than so many out there is because I'm doing exactly what I was told yeah. by my grandfather. And I what, was told that when you're in a fight, you don't have to win. Yeah. There's no need to escape. You just need to survive. You just need to keep your elbows tucked in and don't lose. So we're teaching Jiu Jitsu the way that Eddie Gracie and Carlos Gracie well, intended for it to be taught and practiced. And the way that was successful, forget what they intended, the fact is the proof is in the pudding. Yes. The fights are all we're trying to follow. The, I can guarantee you that the world fell in love with, you know, Hickson defeating Zulu and Hoist defeating Dan Severin and all the challenge matches of well, Gracie's and anybody else fighting these giants. And I can guarantee that those guys were not in the gym counting points as they trained. Well, it just, they were respected. They were getting punched by their training partners, but they, they may have, but they were managing the distance in their minds. If you just replace 10 random black belt sport jujitsu matches, with 10 hoist UFC fights, the Jiu Jitsu would not be where it is today. Right. That's people not why would, people would watch it and be like, eh, it next channel. It doesn't make sense. Next channel. Next channel. Not anybody can watch that. We can watch it. We can watch yes. two black belts compete and say, wow, no, we appreciate he had a good yeah. sweep. We appreciate the details. But someone who knows nothing about fighting and they want to learn, they need to watch something like hoist in UFC 1 to say, you know what? I can do that. There you go. I want to do that. So there you have it, my friends. That's the ultimate question. Would you rather train for street and play for sport or train for sport and pray for street effectiveness? That's what you have to ask yourself. Many thanks to the Valente brothers and all the other instructors around the world who are helping us keep this fire alive and, and keep street self-defense jiu-jitsu available to people who are actually pursuing it. And for those who find themselves in circumstances where it's not available, now you guys have the filter you can apply and you guys know where to get the techniques if you're interested in learning more. Much respect, so appreciative.
the journey continues. On a much lighter note, we're going to Hawaii this June, 17th through 24th, for the dopest immersion camp, Gracie immersion camp of all time. Hmm. Hawaii. Do you believe it will be? It's Hawaii. It has You're to wrong. be. You guys, everyone who goes, jujitsu every day, morning and night training, family, bullyproof kids, women, boom. But the best thing, middle of the day, activity central. You know, everyone who goes will learn how to surf. You know why? Do they believe that? You know it's, why? Hawaii is the Gracie combatives. Oahu and Waikiki is the Gracie combatives listen. for surfing. Anybody can learn. Surfing is cool. But you know what I like the most about these trips is that we meet people who are purple, all different belts. And different academies. Around, different academies who they say, you know what? I am someone that doesn't like feeling pressured to have to escape the side mount. Right. Or I'm someone who, when I mount, I feel like that's what I want to do is just control and just hold for a little bit and be ready. Yes. So these like-minded people pop up. Yes. And they want to discuss more jujitsu, more of yes. that kind yes. of jujitsu. Yes. It's almost like and that's what goes down, you guys. We've done it in Florida for three years, too successful. Now it's time to take it to the next level. Hawaii is where it's at. June 17th, save your spot at GracieImmersionCamp.com. We will be there. And I guarantee you, it'll be the best jujitsu vacation of your entire life. The surfing, you guys, everyone's gonna learn how to surf. Standing up on your own wave. It's you ridiculous. Guys, this is all, he, they want the jujitsu. I know, but they I want, want the, that. They want the I know, there's Gracie some people, survival There's some people who live in Arkansas who have never even dreamt of surfing, who no. will get up on a board and will be cruising. My point. There's old, old, like old ladies, you guys. Old Chinese grandmas, they put on these boards and they push them and they catch their big wave, the big swelling wave, and they right. just ride. And I'm like, dude, if they can learn, anybody can learn. It's we'll see you crazy. in Hawaii and we'll talk jujitsu. If you and your family want to join us in Hawaii for this once in a lifetime jujitsu vacation, save your spot immediately because this one is sure to sell out. Visit GracieImmersionCamp.com to check out the full activity schedule and save your spot today. We'll see you on the beach.